Okay, I think I'll start off with the next uh, set of 10 questions. Okay, so let's go to the first one. Now, uh, I want you to be a little careful about this, okay? So this basically involves a property of a direct delta function that we have, okay? So let's uh, get to this. Let y of x be a continuous real function in the range of zero and two pi, satisfying the inhomogeneous differential equation, sine of x d squared y divided by dx squared plus cos of x dy divided by dx is equal to uh, the delta function of x minus pi by two. The value of dy by dx at the point x is equal to pi by two. Is it continuous? has a discontinuity of three, has a discontinuity of one by three, and has a discontinuity of one, okay? So basically, uh, now this is the differential equation they have given to you, okay? So now what you have to do is you have to basically integrate on both sides of your differential equation, okay? Integrate on both sides of your differential equation and how do you uh, basically, uh, try and do this okay so the thing they've asked you for in the question is to look at if dy by dx is continuous or discontinuous okay so that's what they want you to do in your uh, question now let's okay so this is the first task that you have to do you have to integrate on both sides of the differential equation and then uh, what you have to do is you have to apply a direct delta property okay and before that there is a slight trick here okay so this part, you just leave it as such. Now, this part is a part that you integrate. So when you're integrating by parts, the formula is basically, you take the first function, okay? This is the first function, this is the second function. So you take the first function and then you multiply it with the integral of the second function, okay? And when you integrate a second derivative, you get a first derivative. So you get dy divided by dx. The next thing that you do is you have a negative sign and then you take the integral of the derivative of the first function, that's your cos of x, into the integral of the second function. So the integral of the second function, uh, the second function is basically a second derivative, so that ends up being a first derivative. Okay, so you have dy by dx. Okay, and now what you kind of realize is you get this function here and basically it's a negative of the function that you already have here so those two terms basically cancel out so this is a trick do not try to expand the second term just expand the first term that you have okay so what you end up with is this okay you end up with sine x dy by d okay so this is a basically this is a typo this should have been dy by dx mine is integral of cos of dy by dx and th these two terms basically get cancelled out and then you have this okay so now what do you do with this? Okay, so there is a property that you need to know. Okay, so you need to know a property about the Dirac delta function. So the Dirac delta function is basically a function that is shooting off to a very high value and everywhere else it's basically going to be zero. Okay, so there is a particular value at which your function becomes really high. Okay, sometimes it's given as one, sometimes it's going off to infinity and so on. Okay. So that's what your direct delta function basically does. So now what you need to do is you need to evaluate this term, okay? So for that, this is the basic property that you have for your direct delta function. So if you have a function, say f of x, okay? And you have this direct delta function, delta x minus x naught, okay? And you need to evaluate this uh, basically. So what you do is the function, the value of this function at this point, x naught should be evaluated. So how it's going to look, it's basically like this. So the function rises off or shoots off at x naught and everywhere else it's going to be basically zero, okay? So then you end up having an f of x naught. Now let's look at this. So how do you try and evaluate this, okay? So here you kind of like realize the f of x here is basically one. Okay, so you have one into the Dirac delta function. So what you basically have here is going to be uh, one itself because there's no x component over here. Okay, so if you had x delta of x minus pi by two, you would have ended up with pi by two. But since you just have one, you end up with a one. Okay, 
So now you've got a one here. Okay, so this evaluates to a one and then you take this sign to the other side. So you end up getting a cosecant function. So you get a dy, uh, there's another typo here, dy by dx equal to your cosecant of x. So let's just go back to the question and look at what they really asked for. Okay, so they've asked for the value of dy by dx when your x is equal to pi by 2. And what is the dy by dx that you found out? The dy by dx is basically cosecant of x. Okay, and when you try and evaluate this at pi by 2, you end up getting a 1. Okay, so if you look at a constant function, it's basically not a discontinuous function, it's a continuous function. So even at, it's basically continuous at every point. So not just at x is equal to pi by two, but at every point that you have. So the value of dy by dx at this point is a continuous function, okay? So that's the answer for it. It's supposed to be A. Okay, so let's now move on to the next question, okay? So this uh, basically, if you know the property of anti-symmetric matrices, you can evaluate this quickly, okay? So you don't have to work out the whole procedure. You can kind of like try and eliminate the options out and work this out quickly, okay? If you do not, you end up using the standard way of trying to find the eigenvalues of a matrix. And then that becomes a, and then that becomes a whole, uh, you know, whole kind of bigger problem, okay? So now let's look at this. The eigenvalues of your anti-symmetric matrix are given, uh, for this particular matrix, where your n1, n2, n3 are the components of a unit vector. So if you're looking at this, okay, so basically let me write this out, okay, so that there's no confusion. So you have an n cap, which is a unit vector, okay, and these, these n1, n2, n, uh, n1, n2, and n3 are basically components of your unit vector. So let me just write n1, e1 cap, plus n2 e2 cap plus n3 e3 cap, okay? So now what you have to realize is when you take the magnitude of this, you end up getting one, okay? So how do you calculate the magnitude of n cat? You basically have root of n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared, okay? And that is equal to one. Now, the common mistake that people make is they end up writing n1 is equal to n2 is equal to n3 is equal to 1. Note that these are not unit vectors themselves, but they are rather the components of the unit vectors. Okay, so that's that's the whole idea over here. Now, uh, anti-symmetric matrices have basically uh, two, uh, several important properties, but the ones that I'll be using here are uh, these two in particular. Okay, so let's go to the properties. Okay, so the shortcut way here is to uh, understand the properties of your skew symmetric or anti-symmetric matrices. Now, what do you mean by anti-symmetric matrices? Basically, when you have a matrix, say A, it is equal to the negative of the transpose. So that's what you're looking at here. So let me just go back and show you how it is anti-symmetric because, yeah, okay. So this is a matrix, let's say A, Okay, so you take the transpose of this matrix. So basically your first row becomes the first column. So you end up having a zero minus N3, N2. Okay, first row becomes your first column. Then you have an N3, zero minus N1 and minus N2, N1 and N0. Okay, so what you realize is this. Okay, so this is basically this matrix if there is a negative sign. So let's multiply throughout with a negative sign, okay? So this is basically zero itself, one plus, plus, this becomes a negative, this becomes a negative, and this becomes a plus, okay? So you realize that these two matrices are kind of like the same matrices, okay? So you basically have A is equal to negative of A transpose. Now, those are called anti-symmetric matrices. What are symmetric matrices? Symmetric matrices are when you have A is equal to A transpose, okay? So now let's look at this. Okay, so the eigenvalues of a skew symmetric matrix are either always zero or purely imaginary. Okay, now that's one property. And the second property that you have is the rank of the skew symmetric matrix is always even. Okay, so the thing is that uh, rank is basically when you reduce these numbers up. Okay, so you uh, say if you have something like one, zero, 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 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, okay? So this basically has a rank 2, 
okay now if this were to be zero this is a matrix of rank one okay so basically it's the number of rows where you have some kind of a value that's going to be present there okay so if you have zeros you cut out those rows okay it's basically the number of rows where you have a value present except zero okay so now if you look back at this property that i kind of like pointed out to you okay so they've said that the eigenvalues of a skew symmetric matrix are always zero or purely imaginary now which of these options have always zero or purely imaginary so it can be this okay it can be zero 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 okay um it can be zero one i i okay so if you look at this these are real okay so we can rule out that directly okay we can rule out the real ones this has a mix of real and complex numbers okay so you have a real and complex quantity coming up so you can rule out this now the second property involves saying you have an even rank okay so that's that's another key point that you have you have an even rank okay so here out of these two options that we have we need to like kind of like determine which one it is okay so they've said even rank here so because you have zero 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 three of them having the same eigenvalues this cannot be a possible option so the only possible option is where you have a zero and you have two eigenvalues which are basically real okay so these are the options that this is the option that you can come back to okay now other than that the actual method to work out this is to actually solve the characteristic equation and how do you do that you basically have a minus lambda i okay which is the characteristic polynomial equal to zero and you need to find that out so this is basically a you need to do this whole procedure okay so let's look at that okay okay so i think we've spoken about this in the previous classes um basically when you're trying to check if you have um the thing is that if the eigenvalues are given to you it's very easy to check if um uh, if they are the eigenvalues unless and until you have you know your trace being equal to the sum of the eigenvalues for all the options and your determinant being equal to the product of the eigenvalues for all the options so let's let's just review this whole thing okay so what i will do is i will kind of like write that matrix down so that it's easier for me to work it out okay so you have zero minus n3 n2 n3 zero minus n1 minus n2 n1 and zero okay so this is a matrix um now let me go back to that slide okay so let's look at this okay so trace is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues so basically the trace is the sum of these three elements okay so this trace that you have in the matrix is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues so we can find out that if you add up all the eigenvalues you should get a zero okay so in the question what have they given you the options that have been given to you is basically zero i and minus one okay so that's going to give you zero zero one and minus one when you add all of them that's going to give you zero when you add all of these 0 1 plus i minus 1 minus i that's going to give you 0 and all of these two when you add them up are going to give you 0 so with that particular method you are not able to animate any of the options okay so the next thing that you try and do is find out the determinant which is equal to the product of the eigenvalues okay so the determinant of the matrix basically i kind of like keep repeating this call this this is basically your saras method which is an easy method to kind of like evaluate the determinant and it's basically it cannot be used for any uh, order matrices it can only be used for three cross three matrices okay so don't try this out with your four cross four matrices here okay so let's just do zero n cube minus n squared minus n cube okay not cube n3 zero and one and two minus n one and zero what do you do you kind of like repeat these two columns over here so zero n three minus n two minus n three zero and n one okay so you try to take the product you end up getting a zero you take the product here so you end up getting an n one n two n three with a negative sign and one and two and n three with a negative sign this is going to give you a plus n one n two and n three okay this is going to give you a zero 
this is going to give you a zero and this is going to give you a zero as well. So you have a minus of zero plus zero plus zero. Okay, so these are cancelled out and then you end up with your determinant of the matrix A being equal to zero. So even with that, if you look at the product of the eigenvalues in your options, okay, you're not able to rule out stuff. Okay, so if you multiply all these eigenvalues, you end up getting zeros because all of them have zeros. Okay, so this is the first two things that you usually use to kind of like you know, solve the problem. If you can't do it with that, then you go on to actually solving it using the characteristic equation okay so uh let's look at the characteristic equation now okay so basically you have to find out the determinant of a minus lambda i okay so you uh basically or i is going to be like this okay so your i matrix is basically going to be one zero 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 one zero and zero zero one okay and then you multiply it with the lambda so then you're going to have a lambda lambda and lambda and then you have to subtract this okay subtract a from your uh lambda i so what do you end up getting okay so now this i'm going to again use the sawdust method and work it out and show you how you end up getting this okay so um this is a minus lambda, this is an n3, this is an n2, n3 minus lambda minus n1 minus n2, n1 and minus lambda. So you copy this first column that you have here. Okay, and then you copy the second column down. Okay, that's done. Now what do you have here? You take a product of this, so you get a minus lambda cubed. Then you take a product of this, so you get a minus n1, n2, n3. You take the product of this, you get a plus n1, n2, and n3. The next thing to do is you put a negative sign and then you multiply it this way. Okay, so that gives you a lambda n2 squared. This gives you a plus lambda n1 squared. And this ends up giving you a plus lambda n3 squared. Okay, so now you cancel these both off. And now what you can do is you realize there's a lambda common here. Okay, so you can pull that lambda out. Okay, so you can pull minus lambda out. Okay, and you end up getting something like this. You end up getting a lambda squared plus you have an n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared. Okay, is equal to zero. Now what do you end up with when you, when you kind of like, oh, okay, let me just show you this okay so you kind of like pull that let's let's just ignore the negative sign because this is a zero anyway okay so now you, what you do is you pull out your lambda okay so now what you have is you have a lambda equal to zero and then you have a lambda squared equal to this okay so you factorize that entire term and then you end up getting this okay now what did i tell you before your end cap is basically a unit vector Okay, and it had these several components. So let's just write this out. What is the value of n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared? You have n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared equal to 1. Okay, so that means lambda squared is equal to negative 1. And when you have to write something like this, what do you basically end up doing? Okay, so this is a complex quantity if you want to like find so let's look at this so root of minus one is equal to i right so now what you can do is you can write lambda squared is equal to i squared okay and it can be a plus or a minus it really doesn't make a difference because if you end up doing a minus i whole squared you end up getting a minus one if you do a plus i whole squared you end up getting a minus one why is that you square your negative sign here so that goes away and then you square the i so you end up getting a negative one again Okay, so lambda can be equal to plus i or your lambda can be equal to minus i. And that's what we kind of like saw. It was option A, 0, minus i and i. Okay, so this is the whole procedure to actually uh, find out the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues with this. Okay, so you end up getting your option A. Now let's move on to the next set of questions. Okay. So I think I kind of like elaborated on this. Now let's move on to the next one. Okay, uh, which of the following limit exists? Okay, so um, yeah, so these are the several options that are given to you. Now, 
I don't know if you realize, but this kind of like looks like a harmonic progression. Okay, it's like a harmonic series. Okay, so it's like one plus one divided by uh, two plus one divided by three like that. Okay, so that's one thing that you should be noting down and harmonic series always diverges. Okay, if you have a series like one by n and you have to find the limit of n tending to infinity, basically this kind of a series is a divergent series. Okay. You, it doesn't converge to a value, it diverges. So for that, the limit basically does not exist. But what you can do is you can combine two different uh, functions where the limit does not exist and make it a function that gives you a limit. So basically, you do not have a limit existing for this. You do not have a limit existing for this. But if you combine these two functions in a particular way, you end up getting a limit for that combination. Okay, so let's see what the combination basically is. Okay, so this is your harmonic series. Okay, it is a divergent infinite series. So you have one divided by n, and this is how it looks. And this uh, basically comes from your uh, harmonics in your uh, strings, your vibrating strings. It's something that they kind of like talk in your uh, when you're doing your music and stuff, concepts of overtones and things like that that come from there. Okay, so that's basically irrelevant and stuff. So let's just not look at that. Okay, so now what I want to look at here in particular is this okay so this hn which you basically write in terms of this harmonic series that you have and okay so now let's come to this euler mascheroni constant okay so i told you right if you take two functions and if you combine it in a particular way you will be able to get a limit for that okay you might not be able to find the limit for the first function you might not be able to find the limit for the second function, but if you combine both of them together in a particular way, you might be able to get a limit. Okay. And that's what we're basically doing here. Okay. So we take this thing, which does not uh, have a limit. Okay. This harmonic, harmonic series. Okay. Which does not converge. And then we take a logarithm. And if you combine it in a particular way, you will kind of like realize this becomes a constant. Okay. So I'm not going through the derivation and etc. But if you want me to kind of like explain it, we'll probably do it in another class. Okay. So this is uh, basically your Euler Mascheroni constant. It's also called your Euler's constant. It's about 0 0.5. Okay. So this is what it comes down to. And uh, I'd like to show you how it looks too. Okay. So the idea is that this is your 1 by x. Okay. So you can actually combine this using these two functions. So you have a 1 by x. Okay. And you also have a float function. So what is your float function? Basically, if you have, let's say something like 2.6 coming up, 2.678 or whatever, this, this float function basically puts it down to 2. And similarly, if you have something like 3.5 coming up, it puts it down to 3. Okay, so that's what your float function basically does. It reduces, it brings it down to an integer. And let's look at this. Okay, let's look at this. Okay, so the whole idea behind this Euler Mascheroni constant is that one of the functions is basically like this. Okay, so that's your one by x. And this is basically the float function, which kind of like reduces it to that particular value. So if you see here, let's say if you have a value here, it's kind of like putting it down to one. Okay, so that's that's the whole idea. And here, what you have is this region. When you sum it up, you end up getting an Euler Mascheroni constant. So this is basically the gamma value that you're looking at, this blue region. Okay. So this blue region is basically your gamma, which is equal to something like 0 0.5. Okay. Now let's go back to the previous slide. Okay. So your gamma is basically limit of n tends to infinity minus ln of n plus summation of k is equal to 1 to n, 1 divided by k. Okay. So this particular value is going to give you a constant and the limit does exist for it, okay? So now I told you that we, if we kind of like combine these in a particular way and now how do we rule this out, okay? Uh, basically here you kind of like find this is going to be a divergent series, okay? And you're basically adding this to it so it's going to kind of like diverge and you won't be able to actually kind of get the limit for it, okay? Both of them are being added up together. But what we kind of like realize is if you had a minus ln lan of n, and if you had a summation of 1 by m, this harmonic series, and if you subtract it, you end up getting that euler mascheroni constant, which we talked about. Okay, so this is basically going to be existing, and it's kind of like 0 0.5, and so on.
Okay, so it's it's a uh, it's a recurring number. There's a lot of numbers that come up, so it just goes on. There's like fifty or so, which I've kind of like written down in this PPT. Okay, so um, yeah, and this guy is basically your uh, harmonic series, which is obviously divergent. So you can't choose that. Okay, there's no limit for that. And this guy is basically a root of m. Okay, so it's a different kind of a function and um, I'm not going to probably elaborate on it, but uh, let's just stick up with this because I don't want to like suddenly introduce new concepts and then everybody gets disheartened with, you know, tr even trying to attempt for net. So I will just uh, stop that for now. Okay, so there's a couple of new concepts that are coming in today. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Okay, okay, so let's look at this. A bag contains many balls each with a number painted on it. There are exactly n balls which have the number n, namely one ball with one, two balls with two, and so on until n on them. The experiment consists of choosing a ball at random and noting the number on it and returning it to the bag. If the experiment is repeated a large number of times, the average value of the number will tend to. Okay, so this is, let's, let's look at it carefully okay so what are you doing basically you end up having a bag okay and these are not just bags in a ball like the previous problem that we've discussed okay these are all unique balls okay they are not indistinguishable they are all unique you can distinguish them because they have a number on them and basically what they are looking at is i will pick a ball from the bag and then what will be the average value that that number on the ball will tend to okay so i'm going to be repeating this experiment over a number of times and i will be returning the ball back okay so it's not like there are basically let's say n i'm returning the ball back so that there is going to be n in the next time too okay so now let's move on to how we look at it okay so now if we have n number of balls in the bag what is the prob what is the total number of balls that you have in the bag okay so that is basically the normal series that you have okay so you just add them up and then you have an n into n plus one divided by two so this is something that you've done in your 12 okay 12 probably even 10 okay so you have a set of n balls and you're picking one ball okay and it is a random variable i do not know what its value is okay so that's why i put it as x okay basically when you try in your first time you might get three the try in your next time you end up getting something like five okay so it's a random variable it's a random number so i put it as x now what is the probability of choosing this ball x from the set of n numbers so that is basically easy so you have this number x that has been chosen okay and you divide it by the total number of numbers that you have there okay so the total number of balls that you have in that bag okay now let's look at this to find the expected value or your long-term average or mean what you're supposed to do is multiply each value of the random variable by its probability and add the products okay so what are you doing here multiply each value of the random variable okay with its probability that you end up getting x and add all of these so you have a summation so what do you do basically you take the random variable and you multiply it with the probability of getting the random variable x and then you add all of it up okay so let's look at this okay so what is the average of picking the ball x is what we're looking at okay so you take the average of this that is basically a summation from x is equal to 1 to n the random variable x into the probability that you get that random variable x okay so you take a summation and now this is something that you already calculated x divided by n into n plus one divided by two so you have this two coming up over here and then you have summation of x is equal to one to n x squared divided by n into n plus one okay so so now what you have to do is you basically have to ca calculate this sum okay so these are constants you can pull it out you have to calculate this x squared and this is something that you've done in your pu i think you've probably used it extensively so you have summation of x is equal to 0 to n x squared n into n plus 1 2 n plus 1 divided by 6 okay so this is the sum that's given to you you take this sum and you substitute it back okay so your 2 divided by n into n plus 1 is already there 
So these two get cancelled and you end up getting 2n plus 1 divided by 3. Okay, so you cancel this 2 and 6 and this is what you end up getting. So you end up getting 2n plus 1 divided by 3. And I think uh, the people who have done their second semester statistics, okay, uh, they would have kind of like used this to calculate the average energy. Okay, so there you would have used, instead of this probability, you would have used a partition function. Okay, and then you would have multiplied it with that particular value of energy and summed it up. Okay, so this is basically the standard definition. Even there, you're basically trying to find out the probability that uh, the particle would be in that particular micro state, right? And then you end up getting a macro state. So you basically end up getting your energy. Okay, so this is something that you can compare with that. Okay, so what do you end up having? You end up having 2n plus 1 divided by 3. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Okay, so this is pretty simple. Okay, this is something which is extremely simple and you can do it on your own. Okay, so you have a dx divided by dt here. Okay, what is the solution of this differential equation? So let's just calculate that first. How do you do that? You integrate it on both sides. So you can bring your x squared over here and you put your dt over here. You integrate it on both sides. Okay. So you end up getting an x power minus 2 plus 1 divided by minus 2 plus 1. And then you put a t plus c. c is basically a constant of integration. Okay. And this is going to give you something like 1 divided by x is equal to t plus c. Okay. Uh, with a negative sign. So you so now let's look at this. Okay. So this should have been condition. I made a typo there. Okay. So with the initial condition x not x of 0 equal to 1. So x of t basically, right? So your t is equal to 0 and x is equal to 1. So let's substitute x equal to 1 here and t equal to 0. So you end up getting the constant of integration c as a negative 1. Okay. So substitute back into the solution. So what do you end up getting? You end up getting 1 divided by x is equal to t plus 1 with t minus 1 actually. Okay, so this is basically a minus that you have. Okay, now after that, what do you do? You basically look at, okay, so with this initial condition, the value of x, okay, there should have been this, the value of x blows up as t tends to what value? Okay, so let's look at that. Okay. So this, I think we've done, we've done this. This is what you end up getting. So you find the constant of integration, you find out the C is equal to minus one by this. And now they want to find out the value at which value will X blow up. Okay, so that's what they want. Now, if you look at this, what you basically do is you put your T minus one equal to zero, and then you end up getting zero is equal to one, I mean, T is equal to one. So what you have here is a minus one divided by zero, and that probably, blows up to infinity. So they want the value of x where uh, they want the value of t at which x blows off to infinity. So then you end up getting t is equal to 1. And I think that is the option they've written down here. It's basically 1 here. Okay. So let's move on to okay uh, the next question. Okay. So this is uh, a little... Um, it's familiar, but uh, I think the idea of simplifying it to the answer is a little bit harder. But uh, nonetheless, the answers for this question were pretty much wrong. Okay, they kind of like messed it up. So let's let's look at this. And I think we discussed about finding this normal vector a lot. Okay, we've also done another problem where we found the normal vector and then found the tangent vector. Okay, to the surface. So the unit normal vector of the point A divided by root of 3, B divided by root of 3, and C divided by root of 3 on the surface of the ellipsoid, okay, x squared divided by A squared plus y squared divided by B squared plus z squared divided by C squared is equal to 1 is. So what do you basically do when you want to find out the normal vector to a surface? You take the gradient of it, okay? So you basically calculate the gradient. And how do you write the surface? X square, you basically take that constant term this side to the other side, so that you end up getting a zero. Okay, so that's how you write that function there. Okay, so it really doesn't matter because the constant term is going to be zero anyway when you take the partial derivative of it. Okay, now what is your nabla, your uh, del op do gradient operator? It's basically i hat divided into dou by dou x plus j hat into dou by dou y plus k hat into dou by dou z. 
and then you kind of like try to find this out. So it's a partial derivative. So you just differentiate these particular terms. Okay. Out. And when you do that, you end up getting a 2x divided by a square, 2y divided by b square, and 2z divided by c square. You end up getting a vector. Okay. So this vector is normal to the surface that you have. Okay. Normal to the ellipsoid. And what do you need to find actually? They asked you to find the unit on the vector. So you have to take the uh, uh, magnitude of this vector and then divide it so that you get a unit vector. Okay, so at this point, you basically need to evaluate it. So you substitute your x is equal to a divided by root 3. You substitute y is equal to b divided by root 3 and substitute c is z is equal to c divided by root 3. And basically you can pull out the 2s and you can pull out the root 3s too. Okay, so you end up getting a 1 divided by a i cap plus 1 divided by b j cap plus 1 divided by c k cap. And the unit normal vector is given like this. So what do you do? You take this vector that you have and divide it by the magnitude of it. Okay, so you have this. This is your answer. Okay, so to simplify things, what they basically do is multiply it by an A, B, C in the numerator and the denominator. So when you take this A, B, C into this place, into the root, you end up getting an A square, B square, C square. So what do you do here? You end up getting this. These two get cancelled off. So you end up getting uh, ABC divided by A. So you end up getting a BC I cap plus ABC divided by P. So that's an AC J cap plus uh, AB um, into K cap. Okay. And then you divide this by B square C square plus uh, A square C square plus uh, A square B square with a root. Okay, so that's what you end up getting. Uh, here, the options all were incorrect and they ended up giving grace marks for this problem. Okay, so that was pretty simple. I'll just review what we did before. So in the first class, I think I talked about a problem where you have to calculate the tangent to the surface. Not the normal to the surface, but the tangent to the surface. So what did you do there? You ended up uh, finding the normal to the surface and then you ended up doing a tort product with a random vector. So that you end up getting that random, I mean, like you took the dot product. Let's say this is basically your uh, normal to the surface. Okay. You took the gradient and the, you found out the normal. And this is the tangent vector that you had. This is the normal vector that you had. So you did n vector dotted with t vector equal to zero. And then you ended up finding the tangent vector. Okay. So you take, took this to the other side and then you kind of like found the tangent vector for it. So that's, that's how you... Uh, basically try to evaluate that. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to this question. The graph of the function f of x shown below is best described by uh, the Bessel function, the cos function, the e to the power of minus x of co of cos function, and then you have 1 divided by into the cos function. Okay. So um, if you kind of like remember studying the Bessel differential equations, you kind of like notice that it's, it's kind of like giving you a, 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 the first uh, kind of Bessel, okay? So uh, there are several kinds of Bessel functions that are there, okay? There are several kinds of Bessel functions that are there. And um, basically what you kind of like see is this is the J0x. Uh, Okay, so uh, this basically looks like, yeah, okay. So your Bessel functions are basically the solutions of your Bessel differential equations. And what do you have here? So you kind of like see that as the orders go higher and higher, it kind of like the oscillations kind of get dampened over, uh, over this uh, increasing integer orders. Okay, so uh, you notice that it is this. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd, kind of like go to another share, okay? Um, I want to show you uh, some, how these functions basically look, okay? So your y of cos x was the other option that you had. So it's basically something like this, okay? So it's basically, you know how your cos x looks. So it's, it's kind of like this. Now, what I will do is I will show you what the y e power minus x cos of x looks like. So this is basically what function? This is this is y equal to e power minus x into cos of x. Okay. So this is the function that you have. And let's look at that. 
clearly okay so what you realize is this is coming off to one but in, then it's kind of like dampening and then it's just going off okay so let's look at that so here it's a, like very oscillatory but then it comes off to this one and then it kind of like goes on to a straight line okay so this is this is how the function basically looks like so you have your one here but then it just dampens off so there's no oscillations that come up okay so now let's look at uh, the next function that we have which is one divided by x into cos of x okay so how do you do that let's look at that okay so this is your one divided by x cos of x okay so let's just bring it here yeah. so this is how it looks okay so you have it going more than one okay so it's, it's basically shooting off to a big value and it's like kind of like combining the cost function that you have and that one divided by x function so your one by x is basically like this okay and then you combine it with the cost function that you have and you can kind of like see slight oscillations which are dampening as they go across okay so this is going way beyond one if you kind of like notice that okay so yeah let's move back to our slide okay so i will go back to this question now okay so this is how your bessel function looks like and you should probably be familiar with some kind of like these uh, polynomials that are there your the genre polynomial how can you plot at least the first three orders or so okay so this is how it's going to look uh, your uh, four common uh, uh, differential equations your bessel your hermite your genre and the uh, uh, what is the last one? Bessel, Hermite, Legendre, and Laguerre. Okay. So let's look at this. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that's to do with the Cauchy's principle, and I kind of like keep telling you about this over and over again because a lot of people make mistakes. All the Cauchy's rules apply for only anti-clockwise directions now if you want to find it for a clockwise direction you multiply it with a negative sign once you've solved the problem okay so that's what you're supposed to do all Cauchy's principles apply to anti-clockwise contours okay I think we kind of like did a case of question where, where they kind of made this typo called uh, contour clockwise is that the spelling of contour no okay so contour clockwise okay and then uh they what they basically meant was counterclockwise okay so yeah they ended up goofing up the question and they ended up having to give grace marks for it okay so basically when you look at your Cauchy's rules Cauchy's principle Cauchy's residue theorem all of that it basically applies only to counterclockwise directions okay so let's look at this question the value of the integral okay z cube divided by z squared minus 5z plus 6 into dz so where c is a closed contour defined by the equation 2 modulus of z minus 5 equal to 0 travels in the anti-clockwise direction is so these are the values of that integral now what do you basically do okay so the thing behind your this problem is to use the Cauchy's residue theorem and what do you do basically you take your 2 pi i and you multiply it with the sum of the residues okay inside the contour not outside the contour inside the contour so what do you do basically you take your z squared minus 5z plus 6 and now you need to split them up so you take a z squared minus 3z minus 2z plus 6 okay and then what you do is you take your z into the z minus 3 minus 2 into z minus 3 so you end up getting z okay minus 2 into z minus 3 okay so the poles are basically at z is equal to 2 and z is equal to 3 now let's look at the size of this okay so modulus of z minus 5 okay 2 into modulus of z minus 5 is equal to 0 so you get your radius to be 5 divided by 2 which is 2.5 okay so the radius of the circle or the contour is basically 2.5 okay and what points do you have inside this so basically you have a 2 okay over here and then you have a 3 which is outside so you do not have to calculate this okay 
you only have to calculate it for two. Okay, so your sum of the residues are not sum of the residues basically inside the contour is what you're supposed to include. Okay, so that's how you calculate it. And what do you do? Now you need to calculate the residue for it. So what do you basically do? Let's look at this. So we found the roots of the denominator of the integral. You got these two as the roots. Now, uh, basically, we take only this pole. Okay, we ignore the other pole because it lies within the contour. And now what do you need to do? Okay, so this has basically gone down. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, let's look at this. So you have an integral of z cubed dz divided by z minus 3 into z minus 2. And you have a 2 pi i, okay? And then you multiply it with the residue of the function at z is equal to 2, okay? So what do you do basically? You take the limit or uh, you try to take this pole that you have. So you have z minus 2 into the function that was given to you. That is z cubed divided by z minus 3. And what do you do? You cancel these terms out, okay? And then you need to evaluate this limit at z equal to 2. So you get a 2 power 3 because of z cube divided by 2 minus 3. So that should give you a negative 1. Okay. So what do you end up having? You end up getting a negative 1. You have a 2 pi i into 8 divided by minus 1. That should give you minus 16 pi i. And that is option A. Okay. So uh, that is basically option A that you have minus 16 pi i okay so now let's move on to this question i think you know what this basically means it's your hermite polynomial the generating function that is for your hermite polynomial is given to you now you do not need to know anything about it all you need to do is expand the exponential okay substitute these two values that you have so you kind of like realize n here is 4 and x here is 0 okay so what do you do you take this, okay, and you substitute it in here, and you have to compare the t coefficients. So you have to expand this exponential and compare the t coefficients. So first thing, let's do this. Let us uh, put a zero here, okay? So h, uh, you have four and zero, okay? So let's calculate this out. You have a h, four of zero, and you have a t power 4 divided by 4 factorial equal to e to the power of minus t square plus 0. Okay, so you have a 2tx that's going to be 0. So let me just raise that off. Okay, and now what you need to do is you need to expand this term. Okay, so what have they asked you for? They have asked you for this value that you have. You have a h4 of 0. Okay, so you need that value. What do you do basically? You have to calculate this exponential. So what is the formula for e power x? You have a 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 factorial plus x cubed divided by 3 factorial plus you have, it goes on like that. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand that out. You have 1. Okay. So x is basically minus t squared. So you get a minus t squared. Then here, what do you have? You have a plus t power 4 divided by 2 factorial. And you should know to stop with that okay so what is happening here you take this term okay this is the coefficient that you have so let me just uh, put it in a different color so that it's evident okay so this is t power 4 that you have this is a t power 4 that you have so you have h 4 of 0 divided by 4 factorial equal to 1 divided by 2 factorial and that should give you what so you end up getting h 4 0 equal to 4 factorial divided by 2 factorial and that should give you 3 into 4 which is equal to 12 okay so it's very simple you don't even have to learn anything you just have to use what is there in the question okay the only thing that's involved is remembering this exponential and i think you have it by heart by now okay so um, let's look at this 12 6 24 and minus 6 we kind of like calculated this and this was Four. Now, the thing that you have to be careful about is when you expand the exponential, do not try and put, uh, okay, so the thing that you have to be careful about is basically when you try and expand this exponential that you have, e power x, you basically expand it, you have a 1 divided by, uh, let's just remove this off, yeah, so you have a 1 plus x 
uh, plus x square, okay? And what you're supposed to do, remember, is that you're supposed to substitute this as minus t power 2 and not just something as t, okay? So that's probably where you're going to be making a mistake here, okay? So let's just review this now, okay? So I think we kind of like discussed this. You had the summation of n is equal to 0 to infinity h n of x t power n divided by n factorial and then you basically have to compare the coefficients of t power 4 and what you do is you take these two terms that you have here this and this and you kind of like compare an equator okay so this is basically going to be your t power 4 and you take this component that you have here 1 divided by 2 factorial and then you equate it okay so that's that's a very simple problem it's so it's like the answer is basically given in the question to you Okay, so you end up getting a 12. Okay, so um, this, I, I think I discussed this in the first class, basically a question that is similar to this, okay? So with z equal to x plus i, y, which of the following functions f of x comma y is not a complex analytic function of z? Okay, so what you have here is, these are the several functions that are given to you. And I think I discussed this point very clearly. So Let's just look at this. So what are your cauchy Riemann equations? So your CR equations are basically what we're going to be using here. Okay. So your CR equations is basically, how do you write it? How do you write it? Basically, you have a dou u divided by dou x is equal to dou v divided by dou y. And then you have dou, uh, you have a dou v divided by dou y equal to minus dou u divided by, uh, wait, yeah, I kind of like messed this up is this yeah okay so if you have a dou v divided by dou x is equal to minus dou u divided by dou y so these are the cr equations that you have right and that's how you check if the function is analytic or not now what i did was i wanted to show you how your z equal to x minus i y is not analytic okay not analytic so what you basically look at look up is if these this function basically matches up with this, okay? So let's take the uh, u part, okay? So your u here is basically equal to x. Your v here is basically equal to minus y. So what do you do? do you do a dou u divided by dou x, and that's going to give you something like a 1. You do a dou v divided by dou y, and that's going to give you a negative 1. So you kind of like immediately realize that the CR equations are not being satisfied. So this function that you have here, z equal to x minus i, y, that is a complex conjugate of your z, is not analytic. And using that proper property, you basically evaluate all the rest of them, okay? So how do you do that? You basically compare and look if you end up having terms, uh, the complex conjugate, z bar equal to x minus i, y, in any of the options. So if you have that in any of the options, you kind of like rule it out, okay? So that's basically not analytic. And what have they asked for you in the question? They basically specified not analytic. So don't keep looking for analytic functions. Look for the one that is not analytic. So this is a standard problem that I find, like people overlook the not, and then they kind of like try to check which is analytic, okay? So let's look at this. Now, here you have an x plus i, y, okay? And here, let's kind of like combine this that we have. So you have an x square minus y squared plus 2ixy that we have. And then we have an x square uh, plus 2ixy. Let me take this negative sign. So you have a minus 1 here. That can be written as an i square, right? And what do I have? I have plus i squared y squared, okay? That's what I have. And then I write this as x plus i y whole squared, okay? So what do I have? I have a z there. So it's it, both of these are going to be z minus something. And here I'm going to have a 4 plus z squared. Okay. So this is analytic. Now let's look at this. So here if you pull out the negative sign, you basically end up getting x plus i, y. So even this too is analytic. Now let's look at this term. Okay. We kind of like just simplified this. So this basically is going to give you something like what? You have a z square and then you have a minus 3, okay, whole power 5. So that is going to be analytic as well. But here when you look at your fourth option, you kind of like realize if you pull out your negative sign, you get a z bar, okay? So that's a complex conjugate of your z quantity, whole power 4, 
into 2 plus z whole power 6. So this is not analytic. Okay, so you know, let me just clear all of this. So this is the last option that you have and this is not an analytic function. Okay, so uh, I think that the patterns in these questions keep repeating. Like if you compare all the years together that we've kind of like done till now, this same concept was used in the first class, okay, uh, with a different set of problem where you had to find which function was analytic. But here you have to find a function which is not analytic. So they kind of like tweak it a little bit and then you basically end up getting repeated questions. I mean like repeated concepts that are coming. Okay, so let me just review this. Okay, so basically you're looking at your cauchy riemann equations, your CR equations, which tell you if a function is analytic or not. And these are the CR equations. And I think I kind of like uh, explained this. If you take your complex conjugate of Z, you end up getting it being not analytic. And whenever something, which is a, whenever any function, which, is a, which has complex conjugates is involved, that too is not analytic. Okay, so if your z is equal to x plus i y appears anywhere in the expression, then that expression is not analytic. So you can check this using which we kind of like did right now. Okay, so um, that's it for today. This is the last question. Okay.